there was a point when I thought that if you want to find uh, how things really are, you have to turn to the sciences. And there was a point when I said, well, the sciences say very, say very interesting things. They still interest me much more than other things. But they have not the absolute, uh, 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 the, the absolute gra uh, grasp of truth. I really, I, I really don't remember. I, I can't, I can't, it must have been a gradual process. Part of it was, part of it was that Imre Lakatos very often came to my lectures. Yeah. Now, Imre Lakatos was in favor of science. You know, he was a science freak, as one might say. And just to uh, excite him a little, I sometimes made snide remarks about science. Now, having done so, Imre Lakatos one fine day told me, why don't you write up all your remarks? And I argue against them, and we have a wonderful discussion about it in a book. But he said, make your remarks as extreme as possible. So I made them as extreme as possible, and that was the book uh, Against Method. Only uh, when it got published, Emil Akadov was already dead, so he could not write the second part of it. Now, Philip Frank was one of the founders of the Vienna Circle. He was the successor of Einstein in Prague when Einstein went to Berlin. Uh, he was a good friend of, uh, of, uh, of Einstein. He was a physicist. And he was also a founder of the Vienna Circle, of the first Vienna Circle, which started a few years before the traditionally so-called Vienna Circle, and of the second Vienna Circle, and became professor in Harvard. I came to know him. And I heard, listened to a lecture of his in, in Alpach. And there he said, look, my dear friends, everybody talks about the Copernican Revolution. And everybody talks about how bad Aristotle was. And everybody at the same time says that scientists are empiricists. But if you look at it, Aristotle was the real empiricist. So the Aristotelian arguments were really good arguments. So if Copernicus won, he did not win because of empiricism, but because of something else. This was another element which lingered and started festering only later on. My first, uh, my first aggressiveness went against philosophers who started talking about the sciences without really knowing very much about them, as at that time many philosophers didn't. I mean, they just said, we have to, we have to, uh, um, uh, we, we have to reconstruct what the scientists say and so on, but they didn't do it very well. So actually, if you read it, you know, against method is mostly against philosophy of science as a way of making meaningful the complicated things which scientists say. And I, what I say there, and also of revealing the method underlying the sciences. And what I say there, there is no such method, actually. And uh, that is also nothing new, because I mean, many scientists said that. I mean, Einstein said um, very often, he said that, um, well, compare a scientist with an epistemologist. A scientist faces a complicated situation. So in order to get somewhere in this situation, he cannot use a simple rule. He has to be an opportunist. That is the word that Einstein uses. So, I mean, actually, so when I say uh, in, against method, there is no method, this is something which many scientists had already said before. It was nothing, it was nothing, it was nothing new, although it was something new, apparently, to the philosophical community. And now, most historians of science nowadays, I mean, take it for granted that you can't simply set up a rule and then, uh, then say that this, that this is what science follow, uh, follows. Besides, by now people have discovered that the word science covers many things. Look, there is macroeconomics, there is Conrad Lawrence with his geese, there is physics, I mean, <clears throat> there, are also, there is topology, which is also a science, there is theology, theology was one of the early sciences, you know. Are they all the same thing? Far from. Far from it. So all this taken together made me first doubtful of, of, uh, uh, of philosophy. And secondly, you know, the idea that you find a concentration of truth in science is an idea of philosophers. It is the idea already of, of, of Immanuel Kant, and then of, the, of, of uh, philosophers who follow him. And then it got hold of some scientists, not of all of them, but of some of them who took over this dogmatism from the philosophers. Otherwise, you see many scientists say, we don't know what we, uh, what we are about. We don't understand the matter. When the quantum theory came out for the first time, people said, well, we know how to work with it. We know how to interpret some experiments. But what it means overall, we have no idea. So taking all these things together then, and Imre Lakatos, 
write that book. Don't make it another shade of gray. I want to be able to attack something, you know, which made it a little more radical. Brought out this first book. It was it's all a series of accidents, also stylistic considerations when, for example, uh, I can argue something or I can tell a story. I take a story. If I can say something softly, and if I can say something, I mean, a little more wickedly, I prefer to say it in the wicked fashion. So all these work together to, to create this book. Well, you see, I mean, my difficulty is the notion of truth. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand, and everybody understands, what it means to say the truth before a judge. You know, you are supposed to say the truth, the truth, nothing but the truth. Uh, that's very clear. You are not supposed to lie. You are supposed to try to remember it well, and you are not supposed to leave anything out, which you think is relevant. Of course, you may forget it, you know, but so. But now to speak of the truth of science. Now look, take any scientific discipline. It contains um, approaches which are in conflict with each other. For a long time, Quantum theory and relativity were in conflict with each other. Now people try to iron out this conflict, I mean, with new kinds of theoretical approaches. Both belong to science. But if these two things belong to, uh, are in conflict, they cannot say that within physics we find the truth. We find all sorts of interesting um, stories to tell within certain restricted domains. But the truth, what can you say? An important part of the scientific approach for many people, not by no means for all, is that science must be mathematical. I mean, the book of nature is written in mathematical symbols and so on. Well, what is this? Is this a scientific theory? Is this true? Is this not true? It's very difficult to find out because when, uh, when some scientists go over to more qualitative uh, considerations, Mathematicians catch up with them and provide a theory of these qualitative considerations. In the case of celestial mechanics, it was topology. For a long time, the problem of the stability of the planetary system uh, was not solved in a satisfactory way. So, uh, quantitatively, by means of serious developments, I mean, the series were supposed to converge and give you a certain number for, 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 certain, for, uh, for certain parameters. Now, this ran into difficulties. So some people say, let's uh, consider the whole thing qualitatively, not exactly on what trajectory the planets are running around the sun, but on the whole qualitatively, how the planetary system breathes as it were, and if in breathing it suddenly will uh, explode. That was Poincaré's approach, but this qualitative approach was also mathematized. So you cannot say uh, this idea can be refuted because mathematics changes all the time. So it may be a guiding, uh, how should I say, a guiding idea which advises mathematicians on what areas to concentrate, I mean, those areas where the existing forms of mathematics do not work, so the whole thing seems to be tautologous. So it's not easy to speak about the truth within the sciences. Then, uh, in um, 19th century physics, in any period, in a specific science, you had different approaches with conflicting methodologies and conflicting uh, results. Now you go outside physics into biology. For a long time, there seemed to be a conflict. Now, with molecular biology, the situation is a little different. Now, if you go from out there into, ec into economics, well, I mean, the situation is entirely different, or into a research like Conrad Lawrence with his animals, which seems to me like old naturalism, where you simply crawl around in the grass, you know, and let geese follow you and quack to them and see what they are doing, and um, uh, entirely different approach. So there is not this one thing, science, which has the truth. I mean, this is a completely superficial description of the whole situation. So you see the results in quantum theory is that, I mean, an absolutely well-defined position is not possible. In, in relativity, that is assumed, you know? It's not only methods, but also results in basic assumptions. Yeah. I mean, which are different in different areas of, 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 of the sciences. And so to speak of science, this is talking about a chimera, an entity, a coherent entity, science, which has the truth, or is supposed to have, does not exist. 
And if it exists, then one wouldn't, one wouldn't know what it means that it has the truth. I mean, what, what does it mean? Does it mean that when we study it, we get, we get happier, we are more efficient? Well, even the most truthful parts of science are not very efficient. Things collapse all the time, even in areas where people say, now we found out after all, because it's an engineering problem. And engineering problems are very difficult. So what this, does this talk about truth mean? What does this talk about... Uh, uh, science as a, as a unity mean. To me, these are all chimeras. I understand the PR aspect of truth. If somebody says the truth lies here, then the result is money will go there. <laughs> People will study it more frequently and so on. But apart from that, and apart from the concrete usage of the word truth, namely, well, tell me the truth. Really, have you had an affair while I was away? You know, apart from that, don't worry. And therefore, the whole question, does science have the truth? Does myth have the truth? Also doesn't make much sense to me, you know? Um, what would make sense to me is, is it better to devote oneself or to devote the whole efforts of a society, of a group, and so on, to the sciences, now in the plural, or to something myth, or do we need both, and so on? For example, now, I mean, uh, sciences are needed for ecological purposes. And you see, nowadays the situation is so that so many products of science are sitting around. The droppings of science are all over the place. And as only the scientists can deal with the droppings of science, we need them, you know? It is like somebody, I mean, has, uh, yeah, somebody has found a particular kind of paint that can't be washed off the wall. So, in order to get these paintings off the wall, if one doesn't like them anymore, you need the same guys who put them there because they know something about this paint. So this is one of the reasons why we still need uh, this. Uh, what, I would say is, what I would say is that um, as many sciences are run today, not all of them, uh, a little bit of poetry does a lot to loosen things a little up and to get things a little into perspective. You see, a myth can be just as oppressive as a scientific theory. And as a matter of fact, they have been oppressive. They have, pu they have put people into very strange states of mind and have made them behave, behave in very strange ways. And then the Nazi myth, which is not a myth in the grand, uh, is, one, is one example. So there, you have to be more specific. You cannot say science and myth because there are many different kinds of myths. What myth? What particular kind of science? Why? And so on. So general questions, science or myth, I don't think that makes much, uh, is, uh, that make much, much sense to discuss those, although these are the questions which philosophers mostly discuss. Look, for example, there is still something else. More recently, historians of science have found out, I mean, actually it was there for everyone to see, that uh, science is not, in the Vienna Circle, science was a system of statements. Discussing science was for many people of the Vienna Circle, for Carnap, for Popper, for Hempel, discussing special systems of statements. And bringing order into science meant bringing order into these systems of statements. This assumes that whatever goes on in science is always above board, that people don't act because for, for reasons which are not clear to themselves. It also assumes that making experiments is a simple matter. But if you look at the uh, large experiments today, which are like industrial plants, like in CERN, there are whole industrial plants running, and people have to um, agree with each other about certain things, compromises have to be made, something works, something doesn't work, lots of guesswork is there, there is not enough money, so suddenly one has to change the approach in midstream, and besides, every experimentalist who, who deals with, a, with an instrument has lots of uh, what Polanyi has called tacit knowledge, like a race car driver. A race car driver could not tell you in detail all the things he knows. He can show it to you by driving the race car in certain extreme situations. The same happens with scientists. So there are so many components in the sciences that nowadays uh, some historians of science say that the experimental level is a whole culture by itself. And the connection of the experimental level with what is called theory, which what many people regard as the most important thing, but it's a very, is, is, is a very, dif is very difficult to figure out. Actually, the transition from 
contains many arbitrary elements, so-called approximations. And uh, so if you look at all these things, this whole unity science falls apart into different sciences. Then among the different sciences, we have the theoretical level. And the theoretical level is subdivided into, let us say, elementary particle physics. High theory, that's how it's called, phenomenology. These are the guys who do the curve fitting. They still don't do any experiment. And then the guys who do the experiment that are fed some information by the curve fitters and by the high theoreticians. And they are, they are uh, exchange persons and there are lots of things. Sometimes announcing a certain scientific results is like conducting a political treaty between different kinds of parties where one of them gives a little here, one of them gives a little there, and finally, well, at last we can publish. You see, one of the difficulties which made Newton assume that God interfered into the course of the planets was the so-called great inequality of Jupiter and Saturn. It seemed that Jupiter and Saturn in the course of time moved farther and farther away from each other. Now, Newton knew from ancient observations, Babylonian observations, which he got via Ptolemy, that in antiquity the planetary system was more or less the same as it is today. On the other hand, there was this tendency of falling apart. So he concluded that God periodically put the planetary system in order. Now, there were some other people who said, we shall use Newton's theory and eventually we shall find that this can be explained by physics and we, we, we do not need divine interference. And it took more than 200 years until the people got there, but they never lost their confidence that this difficulty could be solved. So it can, difficulties can uh, exist for centuries, and nevertheless, people, for some metaphysical reason, believe that a certain theory is correct, and then in the end, turn out to be correct. Another example is the early history of wave mechanics. Well, Schrödinger believed for some time that there were waves, that, uh, that elementary particles had a wave-like nature. And he worked out the hydrogen spectrum on that, on that basis, and relativistically, taking into consideration Einstein's discoveries. And he got completely wrong values. Um, because the, st uh, the spectrum was known very well. Did he retreat? Did he say, I'm wrong? No. He made a step back. He said, I shall not work according to Einstein. I shall work according to pre-Einstein. This means he made his uh, theory worse according to what everybody believed at the time. And the worse theory worked better than the better theory, which was explained much, much later. So the, uh, the idea that if there is a conflicting evidence, you have to give up the theory, people never stuck to it. And um, uh, contradicting it, they, they made progress. Sometimes it, it led somewhere, sometimes it didn't. So you cannot, what you have to do is decide from case to case, and you have to know the case in detail, what you are going to do. Now, it's quite useful in this connection to have, as it were, a toolbox of methodological rules. I mean, it's just uh, like uh, 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 rules of thumb. Shall I use this rule now? Shall I use that? Well, that is very useful. So in this respect, that Popper introduced into the toolbox the, the rule of falsification was a very useful addition. His fault was to assume this is the only useful instrument, the only useful tool to apply to theories. That was his fault instead of saying, well, we have increased our toolbox. You see, never throw away the toolbox. I would not say give up all methods. Never throw away the toolbox. Never declare the toolbox itself to be the one right thing or one tool in it. But use it, extend it, disregard it sometimes according to the case with which you are dealing, because you never know what you will run into. It's exactly the same thing as if you start first studying psychology, you know, before getting in touch with human beings and then trying to approach them according to the rules of the psychology you have learned. The best thing is to go right at it, and then you will find that many of the rules of psychology you may have learned don't work so well with real human beings. Some people will say that is such a clumsy theory, the other one is much more elegant. Then some people will object, but look, I mean, this clumsy theory fits the facts better. And then the reply will be, of course it fits the facts better because it's so clumsy, you know. The elegant one, I mean, has, a, has and so on. You can, many people make judgments of this kind, and the results of the research are the results of having applied judgments of this kind. But this does not mean that there exists a canon which establishes from one to five, let us see, all the judgments that can be made must be applied under all circumstances.
You know, for example, uh, Dirac, when he talked about the Schrodinger case, he said Schrodinger was quite right to stick to his theory because it was beautiful. For him, the beauty of the mathematical expressions of a theory was a, uh, was a uh, important criterion. And some people really say, I don't like the theory. It's an ugly theory. It's, it's, it's not uh, hanging together very well. It may fit the facts, but I want something better. So these judgments occur every time. But there is no way of justifying any one of those judgments in a, in a general way. You can justify it in the presence of the case. And then sooner or later, you come back to your own preferences. You know, some people, uh, they're real empiricists. You know, for example, one of the differences between uh, some medical doctors and between molecular biologists is that molecular biologists um, want to have a universal account of certain phenomena of, uh, of human biology. Whereas a doctor wants to know what, is, uh, what works in specific cases. So the, uh, so the knowledge of the doctor will be much more, um, how should I say, uh, uh, scattered than the knowledge of, of, of a molecular bi biologist. On the other hand, the knowledge of the molecular biologist goes for simple approaches, you know, and therefore is too simplistic for the doctor. So in some respect, the doctor is better than the molecular biologist. In other respect, the molecular biologist is better than the doctor. Judgments are constantly being made. The only thing I say cannot be done is justify particular comparative judgments in a general way so that whatever comes, you are forced to apply this judgment. The main problem of the theory of science is that we have at least two general types of criteria which can be in contradiction with each other. One type is what has to do with empiricism. The theory corresponds to reality. And the other is what we can call the logical coherence, the simplicity. The first is a correspondence criterion. The other would be a coherence criterion. It is not easy at all when there is a conflict to decide which research program one should support. However, the best theory would be that which would satisfy both criteria. A one must have an instinct when there is a conflict between the two criteria, which criterion is violated in the more brutal way. It is what makes the great scientist really great. Could you agree with this description? Well, you see, I don't say, I think that some scientists, I mean, uh, don't stick to either criterion, but have something entirely different in mind. Uh, it's also, you know, uh, what you think about the position of human beings in the universe. If you think that human beings are situated in such a way that, uh, now to return to the old business of truth, the truth is evident to them. This means that there was a uh, benign creator God who didn't turn the uh, universe into a universal puzzle, but uh, uh, build it up in such a way that people could do something with it. Then you will be more inclined towards uh, an empiricist outlook. If you believe on the other side, I mean, as if you were almost agnostic, that God is far away, you know, and that the universe that surrounds us is, as it were, a mockery of the ideas of the, of the abstract and distant God, then you will look, uh, then you will think that the human senses are not very good to find out the truth. So it depends on some vast uh, metaphysical background uh, what criterion you will be inclined towards. But in many cases of the sciences, uh, neither the one nor the other turns up. I mean, you may have some uh, particular puzzle in the sense of Kuhn, something not very great, but something which bothers you and which you want to solve. And you try all sorts of things out. You do not ask for overall coherence because your problem is very limited. And uh, finally, you come up with a successful solution. So this, uh, how should I say, big alternative you present to me makes sense as an alternative of two positions about the role or position of human beings in the universe, you know? Have they been put there by a benign God who brings them close to what goes on, or by a kind of bastard who keeps everything away from them so that they have to distrust their senses? There it makes sense on this metaphysical level. But in scientific practice, some people may be influenced by it, others are not. 
and some people may be, may not be influenced by either of them and still get success in the sense of those, I mean, who support a certain kind of metaphysics. So I wouldn't make too much of this big alternative except on a very general metaphysical level, not for the sciences. Well, <laughs> this story of the instinct of the great scientist, you know, <laughs> I, I wonder how many great scientists, I mean, called great because um, of their other achievements, using their instinct, I mean, went off into, into nothing. Many people would say that the late Einstein was an example like that. He tried to find a unified field theory, having made great achievements in all sorts of areas. Now, great scientists. Uh, but he never succeeded. And the young generation, I mean, the young Turks of quantum mechanics, I mean, they said, this guy is getting old. I mean, he can't get away from his ideas. He can't grasp new ideas. So there is an instinct of a great scientist which, uh, which goes nowhere. Uh, Newton, who perhaps, I mean, I mean, I don't know enough about this business, but uh, was one of the greatest scientists ever considering all the research he did, I mean, in alchemy, in theology, in physics, in cosmology, in, in practically every area of human understanding. He was a great scientist, and he had this idea that the planets are put in order by the finger of God. Later on, people said, well, what a ridiculous idea to have. He had, uh, for that, empirical evidence at the time, and secondly, theological arguments, because for him, God was not a principle. God was a person, a father who takes personal care of his creatures. This means the universe is not something which in an, in a, how should I say, in his spare time he constructed and throws it away, like, like Leibniz assumes, you know. But it's something he constantly works on with love. And he is a father, says Newton himself. Our relation to him is subordination, not recognition of a principle. So there, was, there were lots of great scientists, I mean, who uh, made the wrong guesses. Now, Galileo is a, a great scientist who made the right guess in some respect. I mean, this does not uh, prove that in general great scientists make the right guesses. He just was lucky. There is another thing. I just, I just read a book about um, the different types of argumentation that existed at the time of Galileo. Well, I mean, this comes all from Aristotle. There is uh, dialectic, there is demonstration, there is rhetoric. Now, demonstration is where you can show something absolutely. Um, dialectic is where you, argue, where you argue with your opponent, I mean, on some assumptions until you uh, uh, reach a the, and the rhetoric is where you work on the weaknesses of your opponent, on, on your psychological weaknesses of your opponent, and try to bring him around. Now, there, this, this uh, person, uh, uh, Jean-Dietz Moss, he uh, uh, followed the relative percentage of arguments through the period of the Copernican Revolution. And he found that in the time of Galileo, and he concentrated on Italy, the percentage of rhetorical arguments increased considerably, not only in Galileo, but also in his opponents, which is an indication that, that there was a case that could not be handled according to the strict uh, methods of argumentation. It was a difficult case. It was a, a case of belief or disbelief or uh, putting your bets and so on. And here Galileo uh, put the, got the right bet, um, namely something which later on could be used by Newton, because uh, let's realize it. I mean, what Newton said, I mean, about the universe was already very much different from, uh, from Copernicus. There was no <laughs> celestial sphere and so on. Copernicus was abandoned uh, the, the moment he became accepted. You see, uh, once the Copernican knew had all sorts of arguments in favor of it, it was already abandoned because all the new discoveries had, be, had been made. But at the time of Galileo, the Copernican view was suffering under considerable difficulties. And in these circumstances, it is quite reasonable for a scientist to say, forget the difficulties, that's the right bet, and we shall work on it eventually, they will work out. And that is what Galileo did. In these circumstances, of course, you do not have scientific arguments, you have rhetorical arguments to keep, uh, to keep people in line and to, get, and to get followers. And that is what Galileo did, and I said, 
I would say it was quite legitimate to do so, because many scientists also in more recent times, when they are in difficulties, they do this kind of stuff, I mean, just to keep the movement going, because it needs the movement detailed research to show that the view is, is, is good after all. Tycho Brahe solved all, almost all the problems which uh, the Ptolemaeans had, and Galileo never talks about him never talks about him. This is a rhetorical move. He does not argue against him. Tycho Brahe doesn't exist. You see, Tycho Brahe was accepted by the church because this, uh, uh, the, the church wanted to be in agreement with observational results and nevertheless also keep uh, the, the earth in the center. So uh, they defended Tycho Brahe. I mean, uh, Galileo never talks about him except in a very mocking way, I mean, just throwing it away. But that was now a purely rhetorical move in this respect. Now, in this connection, let me tell you something entirely different. You see, what, what interests me in this connection is the church made a decision what kind of point of view to accept. Galileo made another decision. Galileo said the decision which I make should be kept free from theology because it belongs to the sciences alone. This means he rejected any extra scientific authority uh, in deciding what kind of worldview should be accepted. And uh, that, in some respect, I do not like, you know, because uh, if you have a research program, I mean, like, let's say, Galileo's, you have also larger research programs, for example, the attempt to get a good kind of society there, republic or democracy, you know. Now, if some smaller research program is part of a bigger research program, you could also talk, I mean, the, the theology of the time as a research program, you know. Then the smaller research program must adapt to the bigger research program and not the other way around. One of the most refreshing aspects of your work was always, for me, your criticism of the pseudo-seriousness of the academic life all over the world. For example, in Germany, where professors are taken absolutely too seriously and you are attacking this overestimation of this social group. You claim that as modern science had to separate itself from church in order to guarantee the freedom of its citizens, so also a separation of state and science is necessary. Can you explain us more in detail how you see this separation of state and science? Well, the separation of state and church means that um, in public schools, um, which are financed by the state, I mean, uh, religion is not being taught. I mean, it can be taught in private schools, it can be taught in a special way, and the same thing should also happen with the, with the sciences. And there should also more public control of uh, uh, the use of money for the sciences, I mean, of uh, scientific pro projects and so on. Incidentally, that already happens. You know, just in today's Herald Tribune, on the way here, I read an article about pork barrel financing, where certain uh, programs get a certain amount of money, and then the guy who runs the program has the right to earmark, that is the technical term, a certain amount of money for certain scientific projects, which are good only because they bring money to his state. So in this way, scientific, um, you see the idea of the free scientist, I mean, who completely independent of his surroundings, freely pursue, this is very, uh, unrealistic. It simply doesn't exist. So uh, what I would like to happen is that this uh, public interference, in this case it was a senator, be more systematized and be more done with an eye to the benefit of the populations in the state, not only the financial benefit, but also in terms of the products which the scientists produce. And so that scientific research be guided in this way. It is guided already anyway. And that one does not take it for granted that um, science is taught and what, is, what science says is okay. That's how it's taught in the school. And religion is taught somewhere else under different circumstances, more peripheral. One should teach, I mean, all sorts of views. I mean, the best thing to be, the best kind of education is, uh, I would think, but I'm a complete layperson in this respect, you know would be that uh, children, as they grow up, are told a variety of stories. They like stories anyway, so tell them many kinds of stories. Uh, scientific cosmologies, I mean, made understandable f f to the level of the child, mythical cosmologies, religious points of view, all various uh, stories. Then, as they grow up, you tell them, look, the most popular stories nowadays are these, 
So if you want to earn lots of money, you go in this direction. So that when they go up, they make a choice on the basis of knowledge and not uh, on the basis of habit, of the habits of their surroundings. And in this way, I mean, they would, uh, they would be better scientists. You know, they would see the limits of the sciences because also they would see alternatives. They might be inspired by what is contained in the alternatives. And they would also be better citizens. We have now just come to one of the most popular of your thesis, the sentence Anything Goes. You are interested in having many flowers develop and you want us to overcome the limits of the dogmatism. There are strong objections against the principle that dictates anything goes. If anything goes, there is no reason why you should try to search for better alternatives, so the result may be an absolutely dominant mediocrity. There will be no new theories, and if we shall accept the sentence also in the field of praxis, it would follow that there is no longer any difference between what is morally allowed and what is not allowed. But when I read your book the second time, I thought that I should take the sentence in the sense of what you have called intellectual Dadaism. So this means that not only I should not take too seriously all what the old professors have written, but also that I should not take too seriously this sentence, and that, therefore, you are yourself accepting the self-cancellation of anything goes, and that by this sentence you wanted, obviously, to provoke stubborn dogmatism, but not to develop yourself a dogmatic relativistic position. No, no. Uh, let, let me now start from the completely different end, you know. Uh, let's say today's political position, you know, which is a political situation all over the world, you know. I mean, people are dying, people are being shot to death, people are being gunned down, people are starving, people are, uh, don't have enough medicine, are, are dying from illnesses, there's not even enough clear water, uh, clean water and so on. Now... There may still be some people who say we cannot interfere because this is a culture of its own and we must not touch any culture which has gone according to different uh, history and so on. I say to this radically no. I mean, where there is misery, there must be interference and sometimes very almost warlike interference. So, I mean, the, my limit is where people start suffering. And, of course, how the interference will be... Uh, so, you see, a real... One of the kinds of relativism I do not want to have is we have different cultures. Each culture is, a, is an authentic entity in itself, I mean, which uh, you may approach with reverence, but which you should never approach with violence, you know? And that, I say, I mean, is a very dangerous a very dangerous principle. I mean, also inside a, a certain country, like inside the United States, when there is danger to individuals and when there is suffering, somehow people must interfere because there is, I would rega regard one basic value, the well-being of, of, of human beings as regards food, as regards peace, as regards medical stuff, and so on. Now, the other anything goes was meant more or less for within the sciences, you know, not all together. Namely, even take a scientist who takes certain problems very seriously, you know, and wants really to solve them. You cannot say in advance what will work, what approach will work. Will it work when he, when he uh, makes a very rigorous experiment, or will it work when he makes a vague conjecture, bases himself on that and works from there? You cannot say that in advance.